Well, uh, hi there, everybody. How are you today? Uh, uh, oh, there I am. Okay, good. All right. I need to know where I was. I, I lost myself for a minute and uh, I found myself apparently. So uh, it was a religious experience. Uh, let me go ahead and get us started here today. I have way too many things open on my windows, so I need to shut some of these off. Uh, shoot, I don't know how to do that. Okay, hang on just a second. Um, my experience with Zoom is that uh, it um, uses a lot of bandwidth, so we need to get rid of some of this stuff. Uh, I'm sorry, and, and Google uh, tends to be problematic as well. So I'm going to go ahead and shut some of these things down. Uh, certainly the email. Um, good. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. And uh, now that we've taken care of all that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and log us in and we are at the ready. Okay. So anyway, um, in advance, I want to thank you very much for being here today. I, I'm honored. I'm, I'm looking at the, the attendee list and, uh, and Denise, welcome back. And Donald, look at this. This is such a great group today. So Miriam's here. So anyway, thank you all for being here. I very much appreciate the value of your time. So I'm going to move forward quickly because we do have a lot of material to cover. Uh, I'm going to try to get us done in an hour. Uh, I, it, I did a webinar yesterday uh, that was supposed to go an hour, went an hour and 45 minutes, but I don't think we're going to have that today. But there's a couple of things I do want to talk to you about. So anyway, there's my phone number. There's my uh, email address. Uh, and uh, here are uh, some credentials. I guess I always say, you know, I guess it makes me qualified. I did get the American Jurisprudence Award in law school. So that was kind of neat uh, for uh, real estate transactions, which is a national award for uh, knowing what I'm doing. Of course, that was 25 years ago. So it was like, uh, you know, maybe I knew what I was doing back then. I just maybe I don't know what I'm doing today. But but anyway, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you got a little, a little humor in everything that we do. So um, I do teach attorneys uh, uh, Real Property Law, which is an ABA approved uh, class, uh, continuing education for attorneys. Um, and I taught real uh, legal aspects of real estate at, at several colleges uh, over a 15 year period of time. And the reason, by the way, that I'm not teaching there anymore other than the law class is that really, frankly, the, the, um, they were shutting the programs down because they weren't making any money, they, they said. But, um, but at the end of the day, I really want to work with you because you, want, you are in real estate, you want to do real estate, and you want to make money at it. And, and it's, as I always say, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. So I want to make sure you get to keep the money, okay? So uh, chair of risk management all over the place, look at that. Uh, how cool is that? We're going to be talking about stuff that's going to appear to be legal. Absolutely. This class used to be called a lawsuit avoidance class. And so they changed the name uh, to uh, you know, uh, a different name, I hope. Um, so anyway, I'm not practicing attorney. Uh, I do a lot of trial work, um, but it's limited to testifying as an expert witness. Uh, standard of care. Did the agent do what they were supposed to do? Um, and agent's duties of inspection and disclosure, believe it or not. I, in fact, I have a, I have cases right now on the subject. And then uh, market conditions in San Diego County. Um, and and I, I should say, you know, it is our conversation is not intended to be a substitute for the advice of your broker. Listen, you know, you hired your broker. And you, everybody thinks the broker hired me. No, no, no. You hired the broker, uh, and you hired the broker to be there and to help you and 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 to get you through the tough spots and stuff. And so you need to be talking to your broker um, if you have questions about things, but either that or you end up talking to your lawyer, um, and, and then that usually gets a lot more expensive. So, you know, at the end of the day, you need to you need to know when to have that conversation with them. So, um, so good, we did that. Webinars are intended to be interactive. Please utilize the Q and A button to ask questions. I, I would love to make everybody uh, able to chat, you know, live. I, I tried it quite a bit when I first started doing these webinars, but it it, it became kind of a disaster because the Zoom program would would literally hi Lena. The Zoom program would literally unmute people in the middle of, of you know the webinar, and we'd hear all kinds of crazy stuff going on. So, uh, um, okay. So anyway, I do look forward to hearing from you, and and thank you when you do ask questions. It helps me in the direction that I know you want me to go on this. And if you if you've got a question in your head probably everybody else has a question similar to it. And so it, it helps to, you know, because, you know, I'm a practitioner like you, I move pretty quick, you know, I have to adapt quickly to my situation. So member benefits, we're going to talk about the top 10 risk avoidance techniques 
Um, so that's what we changed. It used to be lawsuit avoidance. We're going to call it risk avoidance. Um, should it really be called that or risk management? So um, the first thing that I want to talk about is staying within your boundaries. Um, and so um, in my conversations with the, uh, the Department of Real Estate, they have said, you know, the agent needs to stay in their lane. <laughs> and so and the lawyers say that, too. I mean, you need to stay in your lane. And so you, know, you need to you need to remember. And this is pretty important. Oops. Uh, hello again. Uh, may I be able to see your slides? Uh, that's okay. Thank you, Lena. I'm always so excited. Lena's awesome. She really is. She attends pretty much most all of my stuff. Uh, thank you, Lena. Um, so stay within your boundaries, stay within your lane. Um, and, and I'm quoting here, and I don't have it 100% right, but Wayne Bell, who was just a super uh, uh, commissioner for real estate, um, really a neat guy. And, and he used to say that we are going to hold you responsible. The standard of care for you is going to be that education required to get your license. So folks, here's where we have issues. You know, you, you got a real estate license. Um, I have people quoting me stuff. Well, I just was just talking to somebody on the phone just a minute ago. And uh, and they're, they're telling me things that you know, like, how do you know that? I mean, I don't remember that being on the state exam and I teach the state exam. So, you know, but, 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 you know, maybe, maybe you had, you know, we all had previous lives when we came here. And so we got to remember that we need to not be experts in that. It's like me, it's tell you know, I'm, I have a law degree, you know, I, uh, I have great credentials, but I'm always very quick to tell everybody, I'm not going to give you legal advice. And, and I had another call earlier today that I, I kicked them up to the attorney. They had to go to the lawyer because, you know, it's like, nope, you're not asking me real estate anymore. Now you're asking me legal stuff. So, you know, I just want you to be careful about that. And so if you think back on it, if you think back on a question maybe that your client gives you, and we're all very helpful, right? That's by definition, real estate agents kind of overhelp ourselves sometimes, you know, overhelp ourselves into litigation. But, but you know, you have to remember that you, when you start opining on things that are outside of your lane, you are creating risk for yourself. And so one of my favorite examples is, um, you know, the, the buyer, uh, the buyers uh, ordered a physical inspection by a contract or whatever. They get a report and then the agent to try to save the deal says, oh, well, they're wrong about this. They're wrong about that. Okay, so now all of a sudden their e and insurance and your e and insurance are going to be talking to each other because you just opined on something that you don't have as an expertise. And so um, and, and, and we have to be really careful about that. And I can't stress stress that enough. Do not give an opinion on someone else's professional opinion. Do not opine on what the government says. I mean, you you uh, they go down and they and they try to get a permit and, they, and, they, and you know that they should be able to get it, but you know you don't go down and get the permit, um, and then they come back with a bad result, you need to be careful. So I, the, Linda and I handle this all the time. And, and the way we handle it is, um, and sometimes I'm the I'm usually the one at the end of the phone, but, but uh, you know, it's like, I'm going to put it in the form of a question, right? So, um, so what happened when you did this? And then the person says, well, I didn't do that. And I go, aha, so what do you think would happen if you go ahead and do this? And so, you know, when, so as an example, uh, can I build a two-story house on that property? And so the, the answer is, that's a great question. Stop talking. Okay. But, but it's a great question. It, it, it's like, boy, that'd be cool, wouldn't it? So, you know, well, can you call the city of Del Mar and find out if I can build a two-story house? And the answer is no. Your job is to investigate. My job is to conduct a reasonably competent, diligent visual inspection of the accessible areas of the property. And that's right out of the, your TDS and right out of the Strauss, uh, the, the Easton case in 1970. It actually was printed in 84, but it was, uh, the lawsuit was in 78. And so, you know, I, you know, so here's the answer to your question. Your your answer is 858-755-9313. And people go, how do you remember that? Because I refer to them all the time. And so you and, and like anything else, you know, like I'll call my lawyer and ask my lawyer a question, but that's not giving you legal advice unless I now tell you what my lawyer said, and then I'm going to be stuck in the middle of that. OK, so um, so I don't want to be I don't want to be going there. So. Um, again, uh, I know I spent a lot of time on number one, but you need the standard of care is that education required to get your license. And if you think about it, if you're a broker, you had to pass eight classes, right? And in none of those classes are, are contractor law. 
Okay, um, they, they have some questions that are relevant to uh, construction, but, you know, like a threshold, I guess. I was surprised to see that on the state exam. But, uh, and again, I teach the state exam in several states. And so, you know, again, I teach the salesperson to get your license and I teach the salesperson, to, uh, I'm sorry, to, to upgrade to broker. So, uh, and I think you should uh, take advantage of that. So uh, it's a, a great uh, place to be. So anyway, your standard of care, that education required to get your license. I know you might know about how to build a house, but you know that is not what your license says. And so your broker doesn't want to have to defend you know, your statement about uh, quality of construction and things like that. And so uh, we'll be talking about a couple of lawsuits that I've been involved in um, that are very past tense. Uh, all these lawsuits were always somebody else's. And, and part of the reason was because, you know, I just don't have an opinion of anything, right? I mean, I literally, I just tell people, this is what they said. This is what they said, you know, and and uh, and and I'm, I'm careful. So, uh, you know, if it's not your opinion, then tell them it's somebody else's opinion. So again, do not make representations that are outside of your field of expertise. And if you're in real estate, that means you've got to take off your lawyer hat. You got to take off your, your contractor hat, um, and I know real estate agents that are also contractors. And so, but you got to remember when we're here today, like our agents, we have agent, Linda has agents who have contractors licenses. I don't want to see that, that number on your business card, right? Because you're, you're here doing business as a real estate agent, um, not as a contractor. I need a separate card for that. Do not put our address on it. Things like that. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, that was number one. Um, number two now, um, Remember to whom you owe your fiduciary duty. And so, you know, I've been doing this since the late 70s, and I have yet to meet someone other than a real estate attorney who can explain fiduciary duty to me. And if you think about it for a second, you see the words all the time, but do we really know what that is? What is that duty? And so, you know, by definition a fiduciary duty, and this is going to sound like it, uh, it's using itself as a definition, a fiduciary duty of utmost care, integrity, honesty, and loyalty in the dealings with either the seller or the buyer. And if, if it looks familiar, it's on your AD form on page one. Okay. So it's the form you use in every single real estate transaction that you do. But, but this is, this is that example of where we're using the, the term to define itself. Um, so think of it this way, to place your client's interest above your own. Um, so, you know, when we get into that real estate transaction, we're trying to salvage the transaction. Uh, are we throwing our client under the bus? Um, be careful what you wish for, because sometimes you might be throwing, you might be doing it a little too hard. And so you, you need to remember utmost care, integrity, right? Something you can't buy honesty with everyone, loyalty to your client, which by the way, that carries on after the uh, transaction has closed, right? Uh, you, you, your agency relationship ends at closing, okay? That, that's really clear, all right? But, but you need to also keep their information confidential even afterward. And there's some things that are required by statute to remain confidential. And then there's other things that are uh, that maybe the client asks you to keep confidential. Um, and and again, it, it you know, you, you want to be careful that you don't uh, that you that you follow your client's instruction as long as it's for a lawful purpose. And if you're not sure if it's a lawful purpose, you need to be contacting your broker. OK, all right. Uh, so on the seller side of things, and we're just going to talk about did you meet your duty? So let's take a look. When I have a pocket listing, this is a pet peeve of mine, okay? But when I have a pocket listing, a pocket listing, it used to be, you know, nudge, nudge, I have a secret, I know somebody wants to sell their house, right? Okay, well, now, if I start advertising a property for sale and I don't have an employment agreement, I don't have a listing agreement, I don't have a buyer representation agreement, whatever, if I don't have an employment agreement, then the, the Department of Real Estate says, huh, that sounds like a tort false advertising, intentional misrepresentation. So you're advertising something where you don't have an employment agreement. You put your sign in the yard, but you don't have a listing agreement with the seller, right? And so then we're going to get into quasi uh, agency and, and, uh, and ostensible agency in terms that you really don't want to know, uh, right? But 
But I tell you, they love them in depositions, okay? So with pocket listing, so, but that was the old pocket listing. Now the new pocket listing is I take a listing, I have a listing agreement, but I don't put it into the multiple listing service. And so how is that a problem for me? Well, first of all, uh, it's, is it a problem for your seller? Is If the property is not in the multiple, and whether you agree with clear cooperation or, or coming soon or whatever or not, it, are you benefiting your seller if you don't put it into the multiple listing service? Okay. Um, Gov Hutchinson made a great comment about uh, two or three years ago when he did the new laws. And I, I was standing right, you know, 20 feet from him. And he goes, you know, the fact that you wanted to double end the deal is not a defense to why, you know, you didn't put it in the MLS, you know, that pocket listing that, that now you had a listing agreement, you chose not to put it in the list, multiple listing service. Did you give the world an opportunity to bid on that property. And so that pocket listing so suddenly becomes suspect. There's that little term that I'm sure you remember called steering. Um, the FBI watches these, the Department of Real Estate watches these, and they're looking for those listings that sell right away. Agents used to put in the listings sold before processing. We had all those really cool terms, but did you really benefit the seller or did you really create the neighborhood? Did you steer people into the neighborhood because you were making Making up the, the composition of the neighborhood, right? And so there's, there's a task force that's looking at this. So let's, let's you know, we, we want to be careful about those pocket listings. I know they're popular. I know that people would, you know, of course, we'd all love to eat twice, right? But, uh, you, you know, you really need, you know, it's so like even in our office, we don't allow pocket listings. So, but literally, you know, there you put the property on the market, make sure you got the most money possible for the seller. Uh, and, uh, and I had a case in San Francisco where the uh, agent went out, took a listing, um, goes back to the office and uh, sells it to one of her own clients. And so the property was two point, uh, I think it was $2.2 .2 million um, and sells it to one of their own clients, never went to the MLS. So, so then the, the, the trust attorney asks, uh, hey, did you put this one in the MLS? And they said, no, we didn't. We, we sold it right away. And they said, well, let's get it put into the MLS. Do you know they get a $4.2 million all cash offer from a buyer? So now guess what? The attorney's going after the, the broker because you know what? You, you should have put it in the multiple listing service. We had the ability to have more uh, uh, competition on that property. And, it, and it's starting to look like you didn't want the competition. Remember that fiduciary duty thing that maybe you did not want the, cooper the uh, competition. You wanted to sell it yourself. Uh, and so we got to be careful about, you know, I had a broker ask me back in 1984, um, I won't even tell you the name, but but they asked me, they said, what motivates people? And I immediately responded with greed. And so we got to be careful that we're not so greedy that we get ourselves, uh, you know, first of all, you shouldn't be greedy anyway, right? But but uh, some of these things that we do, um, you know, we all know people that have uh, gone to prison for, you know, you know, pushing the line, right? So, you know, I tell everybody all the time, there's that line you don't cross. And so in my business practice, I never get close to the line because I'm not going to take that, you know, I, I'm not interested in that. But there are people I know that dance back and forth and then they, they sometimes just really forget where the line is. And so, um, we had a really uh, uh, a super real estate agent, in San Diego, who did 42 months in federal prison because they kind of lost track of where the line was. So um, I don't know. People say, well, federal prison, you got cable TV, you got three squares a day. Yeah, right. OK. So anyway, so my pocket listings, uh, it, it can be problematic. So I'm just asking the question is, you know, did they violate their fiduciary duty to the client? Um, you know, they were able to sell it for twice as much after they put it in the multiple listing service. They gave the world an opportunity to bid on the property. And so with dual agency, we, we, we look at those things. And, and again, dual agency belongs to your broker, right? So, so if you are a sales associate or a broker associate, you have a responsible broker, a broker of record, right? Um, Linda's our broker of record uh, and a very capable one. Um, and, and so if, if I take a listing and I'm under Linda's ticket and then I, I get a, an offer from another agent within our brokerage, it all has to do with Linda. I don't have to be the dual agent myself. I don't have to represent both buyer and seller, but if I'm representing the seller, another agent under Linda's ticket brings in the offer, that's dual agency, okay? And so again, I, this is a lot of my trial work, all right? So 
be really careful about that. Um, we have an attorney who is uh, in our office who is a broker, um, and he will not do dual agency because in the legal field, we just don't understand how can you not have a conflict of interest, right? And so this guy, he takes listings on properties, usually short sales, things like that. He's a bankruptcy attorney, um, and uh, and I become the buyer's agent. Um, so, but because he won't represent the buyer, so it's still dual agency because it's under Linda. Right. And so it's still dual agency. We make all the disclosures. We, he and I do not talk about how much the buyer would pay or how much the seller would sell for. We do not have that conversation. He's an attorney for crying out loud. He knows. So watch out for that dual agency situation. It may sound really cool and the money is great. But, you know, I always tell people, make sure that you're going to be prepared to move to a place that doesn't have extradition. So, you know, watch out for that. OK. Now, what about on the buyer side? And so on the buyer side, how about writing multiple offers on multiple properties? People do this, right? And I'm sure if you've been in the business for any period of time, you've had this happen to you where, you know, the, the, so the seller may write offers on multiple buyers offers, right? That's called a counter offer, okay? Um, but can the buyer write offers on multiple properties? And the answer is yes, they can. But have you disclosed to the multiple sellers, uh, uh, agents, whether or not you are writing writing offers on other properties. And I've seen some people use it as leverage. You know, hey, we're writing offers on other properties. If you don't accept our offer, we're going to buy this other one. Okay. Have you created a problem for your buyer? Have you created a problem for your broker? Um, and so, and I know people do kind of some interesting things. I call it creative realtoring. So, uh, um, uh, so creative realtoring is, is where we just, you know, we, it's like in law, we call it bootstrapping. We just we know the result we want to get to. We just kind of stuff it in the boot to try to make it work. And then that's what we do. So so how do you avoid? I mean, people say, I love it because they'll call me up on the phone. They'll say, I know the law says. And then I'll say, I am not going to help you break the law. <laughs> it's, it's like that easy, right? So can I do this? And you can do anything you want. And, you know, may I do this? That's a whole nother thing. So so if if I am representing a buyer, and I want to be able to write offers on multiple properties, right? I tell the buyer, you're going to write them one at a time. So what does the buyer say? Is there a way for us to speed the process up? And so I never in the buyer, uh, in the uh, uh, RPA, in the purchase agreement, I never give them the default three days to make a decision. I'm giving you until five o'clock, right? I don't care when it is. You know, right now it's 1020 in the in the morning and uh, I'm going to write an offer and, and uh, you you have until five o'clock. So I set the expiration date of the offer. Um, some of you will remember in the old days, you know, whatever that was, but in the old days, we would present all of our offers in person, right? I mean, that I, what happened? We lost all that. It's like top gun, you know, we're teaching you dog fighting skills. So, you know, but we've lost that, uh, that habit of presenting our offers in person. I'm sad to say, I don't know if it'll ever come back. And fax machines were what ultimately ruined it for, for uh, our industry as far as those offers are concerned, but I'm going to write my, we used to write upon presentation, right? And so I'm going to go in there. I'm going to present my offer directly to the seller in the presence of the seller's agent, right? Okay, I may not do it otherwise. Um, there's some exceptions to that, of course, you know, you don't, you're not getting a response, can't get a hold of the broker, whatever, you know, you, you pick up, but the, the seller's agent by MLS, by all the rules, has a right to be present, but if they they are unavailable, then you may have some exceptions to that. So so uh, again, you need to check with your broker on that. So but but I'm only gonna but today since we're emailing offers to each other back and forth, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a time limit on the offer so that my buyer can write an offer on the next property. I always say you know if the seller made a decision to sell the house. Did that change between the time they put it in the multiple listing service and when I wrote my offer? And the chances are no. Um, but I've I found in my experience that if I write an offer on, on uh, you know, and I give them three days, it just seems like I get an extra, you know, uh, uh, competing offer every day until the three days are up. So I don't want a whole lot of time to pass. I'm going to give you, and, and the market has changed, folks. I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, it is changing. Um, market times are increasing. Sellers are panicking, things like that. It's not a correction. It's not a bubble bursting. But, you know, at the end of the day, you have advantages today that you really need to learn your profession. And so, I literally will give them until five o'clock or right now, like I said, it's 1024. 
maybe I give them until noon. But see, when I send my offer over, I'm, I'm losing the ability to negotiate on behalf of my client. Now the negotiation is between myself and the seller's agent. And it's like, you know, they're not the ones that should be negotiating. So so at the end of the day, I'm probably in this scenario, it, it's, it's early enough in the morning, I may not give them until two or three. Because remember, my buyer wants to buy a house and we're, we've got other houses we want to uh, write offers on. So this is how I handle the buyer who says, let's write offers on five different properties. And it's like, eh, we can do that, but we're going to have to do it in steps. Okay. All right. Um, and then my contingency free offer. And, and it's so funny. I was talking to an attorney about this yesterday. Uh, and, you know, my world is half brokers, half attorneys. Uh, and it was a pretty funny conversation. But, you know, we are already seeing, and I'm on the expert witness forum at the state level here uh, in California. And we're already seeing the lawsuits where the buyer buys the property, the agent told them not to have any inspections done if they wanted to get their offer accepted. Um, they even put it in the offer. Uh, and, uh, and then now the buyer uh, owns the place. And now they discover, of course, all the stuff that's wrong with it. How come the seller didn't tell me about that? How come the seller didn't tell me about that? Um, well, those are things that I would have known if I had had an inspection done of the property. And remember, even if they remove the contingency, you still still have the inspection, right? Um, you, you never, as a seller's agent, you never want to get in front of a buyer's ability uh, and, their, and their, their right at law to investigate the property, okay? So, um, so I, I find this to be really problematic. I, we, people were doing it and I just sat back and I went, oh boy. Okay. Um, anyway, I, I could keep you here all day on stories, but uh, um, uh, I, I did have a, a, a Navy SEAL, a retired SEAL that I represented, just a wonderful uh, uh, husband and wife uh, family. And writing an offer on a property and the seller's agent told us that that uh, the seller wasn't looking at any offers unless they were non-contingent. And I said, well, my guy's a VA buyer. <laughs> and so, you know, they, they, you can't have a non-contingent offer with a VA buyer. It's just not going to be possible. Um, I told my buyer the conversation and the buyer said, yeah, well, I, I'm okay with that. We want the house. And I went, all right. But even if you, you know, waive your contingencies up front, you still have this, 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 and this. Um, and so they were, they were very, uh, um, you know, they said, no, we're buying this house. And so, you know, interestingly enough, um, so the contract came, to, actually, we were a backup offer because they accepted another offer for cash because they were afraid of VA. Well, the cash never showed up. Wow. Huh? And, and, you know, I said, my guy's going to close and the seller's agent said, yeah, you've done everything you've promised to do. I, I don't doubt you. So literally we went under contract, you know, after having lost the property, we got it back when the buyer, other buyer didn't show up with the money. And, and then the, the, we, I called the seller's agent and I said, we've got the physical inspection scheduled for Thursday. And he says, you don't have a physical inspection. I said, yeah, we do. And he says, well, you remove the contingency already. And I said, uh, you need to check on that. And he's the broker. Right? And I, I said, you need to check on that because the buyer still has a right to do the inspection, the investigation of the property. But, you know, even if, whether they waive the contingency or not, we well, you know what was funny is that we just kept moving. And, and he called me back and said, go ahead and do your investigation, buyer's investigation of the property. And you know what ended up happening? A whole bunch of stuff was wrong with the place. We sent over requests for repairs. You know, the seller did it all. The seller did the pest work, even though it wasn't required. And so, but, you know, we just kept asking for stuff and um, just, you know, all the requests went through the seller's agent. I guess the seller wasn't aware that they wanted a non-contingent offer. Okay. So be careful about that. Uh, you, you know, and, and, you know, those are the kinds of things you need to report. Okay. All right. Um, your job is to advise and counsel. So what does that mean? That means you review the paperwork with your client right? All of the paperwork, okay? That's going to include contractual forms, disclosures. If you're going to get into a lawsuit, you know, the next three years, it's going to be a failure to disclose lawsuit, okay? So your job is to go over these forms. I'm not going to tell you, you know, DRE is really clear about this. You need to tell them the warnings. You need to, you need to review the preliminary title report. You know, you, I'll send you the field case. So field versus Century 21 Cloud and Finesse. It essentially put them out of business. They were a great brokerage firm, um, but, uh, but but 
unfortunately at the time, um, the PR didn't show up until after the transaction closed. And so that's when the buyer discovered that that there was, uh, you know, the city of Otay Mesa could dump the, the water tower and flood the property. And they said, well, we don't really like that. We didn't know about that. And this went all the way up to the Ninth Circuit. So, you know, this was an appellate decision that and nobody could afford to go further up to the Supremes, right? So, so you know, it's essentially the rule now, and, and it's the field versus Century 21 Cloud and Furness case. And, and uh, you know, good real estate agents, it's just that, you know, just bad luck. You've got to go over the prelim with your client, even though we're not supposed to be giving legal advice to our client, you do still need to go through the report and explain some of the features. And so I know that I do a class on how to read a prelim. Uh, and I think I'm due to teach it again in the next couple of weeks. And it's a must attend. Um, preliminary title reports are not that complicated, but it is an insurance you, you need to have your client, if you see hot buttons, you need to have your client talk to the title officer about those hot buttons, okay? But that's your duty, advise and counsel, not give legal advice, physical inspections, you know, yes, you have them sign the buyer's uh, election of inspections form, the SDAR seven page form on, on uh, what inspections are available to them. OK, so physical inspections, you need to go over those with them and, and answer questions. Um, number four. And, and by the way, I put this in here and and, and I had a case recently where the uh, agent sent everything to the client and said, call me if you have any questions. That is not a defense, okay? So call me if you have any questions. You need to be going over the forms with your client. And if you don't know what the forms say, we've got a whole library of classes that I'm doing on what the very various forms do and what they say and, and how to explain them to your client, okay? So, so it's kind of important. But in this case, uh, you know, they, they were having the transaction coordinator do all the explaining and the transaction coordinator, A, wasn't even licensed, but now they're an employee of the company and so, you know, that's going to create some other issues. And we're going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes. All right. So um, questions. Oops. I, I'm sorry. I got a whole bunch of questions. Uh, how smart is coming soon, but never actually on the MLS. If you have a coming soon listing, um, we it goes into the multiple listing service. We will make it active on day 21. Um, so uh, got sold during coming soon, which is interesting because the public is not supposed to see coming soon listings. So uh, uh <laughs> If your buyer has several homes as possible buys, would you start writing your offer for the second one as soon as the first offer expires? Oh, yeah. Um, you, you could write all four, but, you know, again, you would, and that's a good question, Lee, you could write all four. I just wouldn't be presenting them to the seller's agent. I would explain to the buyer the risks inherent in doing presenting four at the same time. You know, I, I've had agents say, well, I just tell them we're writing offers on other properties. And so uh, I'm really going to like to see that documented someplace that you did tell the agent that because the agent's going to say you didn't. And then I have people who say to me, well, we can get out of the transaction for any reason reason for 17 days. Where did that come from, right? Some of you remember the old contracts before October of 02, where it was a 14-day contingency period. Um, but at that time, they were all passive removal, which means you didn't have to affirmatively remove a contingency. Now, when you go to remove contingency, it's like a life-changing event, right? You got forms to sign, all kinds of stuff. And so we used to tell the buyer that, I'm sorry, the agents, I never did, but but of course, but the agents would tell the buyer, ah, you got your physical specs, you got this, you got that, you know, you got all these things that you can do to get out of the transaction. That's bad legal advice, right? So I wouldn't be telling people to get out of a transaction for any reason, because it's not true. You have to have a good faith reason for getting out. And that's in your purchase agreement. So, so you need to be aware of that. Uh, last question uh, at the moment. Uh, how do we understand preliminary spot? Uh, take my class um, or um, or go to SDR's website. I'm going to give you the link to the past webinars and you can uh, take the, the class. I actually had uh, somebody call me on the phone and say, you know, uh, I just watched your how to read a preliminary title report. And I go, uh, OK, who are you? And they said, well, I'm a buyer. I said, how did you get access to that? Well, we don't have a firewall on, on the SDR website, so you all can go there. OK, so this guy found me on the Internet 
watched the webinar and I said, well, why are you in a transaction where agents are involved? Yes. Okay. Well then why didn't they explain it to you? They said, I don't think they knew the answer. I said, well, I'm not going to get in front of that. Um, why don't you call the title officer? The title officer wouldn't return this guy's call. I'm like, oh boy. So here's, here's this webinar that explained to them and they went on and bought the property. Right. But, but, you know, the, a simple explanation. And so, um, so uh, Lena, to answer your question, it's on the, on the uh, YouTube website for SDAR or send me an email email and I'll take care of you. Okay. But it's going to be, uh, um, I think I'm doing it next week or two weeks from now, but it's definitely a valuable uh, uh, thing to know how to do is how to read that prelim. Okay. Um, all right. So do your own AVID and you all know AVID is agents, visual inspection, disclosure. It is tied to civil code 1102.3. So on page three of the transfer disclosure statement, you own page three. And so we actually changed the language on, on the agreement. It used to say agent notes, no items for disclosure. Uh, and then the next line was agent notes the following, but we determined that there wasn't enough room to really tell people everything that they are observing about the property. And so we added a third box, which says the Abbott. And so I teach check the box avid um, and yet I got I, I got involved in an offer with a, another broker that the that the seller's agent checked the box and said agent notes no items for disclosure listen if you're gonna check that box I will go with you to the property and I'll bet you we can fill the blank right um, but we created the avid uh, on purpose we created it to jog your memory as you go through much like we have the SPQ to jog the seller's memory and so um, the, the hot buttons in here are page one, all kinds of pre-printed disclosures. The attorneys pop up, the, the, the defense attorney, right, for the for the broker, you know, in 10-point uh, uh, letters, 10-inch uh, letters on the board in front of the uh, jury that says that, you know, the agent's inspection and the seller's disclosures are not a substitute for you doing your own investigation. So, you know, when the buyer sues, that's that's what they go. They go right there to that form. So you need to be using that avid. Um, and so page two is all about the interior of the property. Page three is all about the exterior of the property. So you, you need to be fluent with how to fill that out. And so, you know, if you don't see anything, then put nothing noted. Um, but but your job and, and uh, um, the deputy commissioner, the district manager, manager for Southern California for the Department of Real Estate says, you know, we need to make sure that, 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 that you're doing an inspection of the property. And so that AVID really serves that purpose. But then there's that box. And I want to talk to you about the box. And I didn't pull it up here. But but on that box is it, it, it says in there, uh, the company, uh, the agent who performed the inspection. And so the Department of Real Estate has said in the meeting that I was in, in October of 18, uh, they, they commented that, um, you know, we, we see people on teams where the, uh, you know, the agent will go out and do the AVID, but then bring it back to the office and the team leader will sign it. And she says that we think that's fraud. Well, it is. It says you performed the inspection and you didn't perform it. So, you know, Joe and I went, I took a listing in uh, Lake Forest and Joe went around and he's a broker in our office and he went around the property and did the AVID. I, it was my listing, but Joe did the AVID. And so Joe signed off on the AVID. I did not sign that AVID because I didn't do that AVID. And so the AVID was, okay, again, under Linda, right? So, but Joe did the AVID and I'm not signing that document because he did that AVID. Okay, does that make sense, everybody? Do your own, okay? And so, um, and then again, be thorough, but remember, and I always tell people, real estate agents, don't open up doors, don't, you know, unlock things. I wouldn't turn water handles. It's just stuff that you visually observe, all right? So there's, a, I, I could do a, a whole class on the Avid. It's one of my favorite documents, but, but you know, I'm going to tell you at the end of the day, you know, I, I wouldn't touch anything because again, it's your reasonably common diligent visual inspection of the accessible areas of the property, okay? So Upload photos inside the program that I can show you. Let's take a look uh, that I can show you. So let's go in here and I'm going to pull up my, uh, uh, let me see if I pull up my buyer offer template and I'm going to pull up my Avid. So uh, uh, this is just, this is our template. So here's my Avid. So let's take a look at this. This is pretty cool. <clears throat> um, see right here where it says photos. Can you all see that? You can go with your uh, with your cell phone and take a picture and load it right into this program. 
all right? You can attach photos, click on that, boom, you pull up the photo, okay? You can attach the photo. That's, that's exhibit A in your defense, right? So take pictures, go in there, take pictures of stuff. Remember that your job, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is to disclose, not diagnose. So, you know, if you see stains, you say stains. You don't say water or anything like that. And we'll talk about that in a minute because I had a really good lawsuit over a, a, a an, an agent put in that it was a water stain and it turned out it, it was actually paint. So um, anyway, we'll talk about that in a minute. So upload your photos. Be sure you have a written agreement with your client. Okay. Remember, as, as we've been talking over the many years here, you don't have a client until you have a written agreement with them. So just like with the seller, you know, you don't have a client, you have a potential customer, but you don't have a client until they sign the listing agreement. The same thing holds true for the buyer's side of things. So on the buyer's side of things, you know, you're helping them find a house, but they may not be your client. Right. So you need to establish agency. You need to establish uh, an agreement with them. And we're going to talk deeper about that in just a second. Um, and I'm going to quote Wayne Bell again on some really good things that he had to say about it. So remember what I always say, when you define your duty, you limit your liability. So when I take a look at that buyer representation agreement, it's going to say right in the agreement what it is that I'm going to do for you. Right. So uh, here I'm going to pull up my uh, buyer representation agreement. I'm going to go to full screen and I'm going to scroll down here. It used to be paragraph five and six, but now it's going to be uh, um, we've we've moved it around a little bit right here. Paragraph number six, broker authorizations and obligations. And then number seven, buyer obligations. So I'm defining what it is that I am going to do. And, and tomorrow at two o'clock, I'm doing a class on this form and it's a two hour class. And I recommend that you be there for that. It's going to be, a, it's going to blow your mind. Okay. So, but look at all this stuff, uh, you know, and so when the buyer sues us, and when we don't have the buyer representation agreement, they say, well, you were supposed to do this and you don't have anything to stand on because, you know, you say, well, that was the normal, you know, the way normally we don't do those kinds of things. Well, then if you had told them that, then, and that's what the writing is all about. Okay. So, so that's what I'm saying. And I'll get it deep into this tomorrow. So. But when you define your duty, you limit your liability. So on the seller side, you have a listing agreement. On the, on, the, on the listing agreement, it says to the seller, this is what I'm going to do in exchange. This is the quid pro quo. This is what I'm going to do in exchange for you employing me. Remember, it says employees and grants, right? So you are employing me, and this is what I'm going to do for that, okay? And so the same thing happens on the buyer side. And now, you, as I showed you a second ago, you have the buyer representation and broker compensation agreement, which I think it made a lot easier for us rather than having three buyer listing forms we just have the one now okay all right um use a checklist i cannot tell you how important that is why because you're going to need to prove that you do the same thing every time so if you go up into here and we have our own checklist in our office but if you go up into here and uh, let me see if I move myself out of the way. I'm in a transact. I, I need to get out of the form. So I'm going to up here. See right here where it says checklist. I'm going to click on checklist. OK, this is you need to have a checklist. All right. And so we don't have one in here because we have our own checklist and we don't we probably should load our checklist into here so that our agents would understand what it is that we're doing on their behalf. But but at the end of the day, you, you need to have a checklist. Why? Because you need to be able to prove that you do the same thing for everybody in every transaction. OK, no discrimination here. I do the same thing for everybody. OK, so use that checklist and 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 and, and have one if you don't have one, uh, you know, mine's four pages long. So, you know, and it's, it's very tiny font. I'm surprised Linda can still read it. So check with your broker. Your broker has a checklist. It's usually the minimum th stuff that you need to have to get paid in a file, right? Your broker should have a checklist. And if, you, and if your broker has one, you need to use it, right? Uh, why? Because they're saying if you use our checklist, you have some protection, okay? So, but especially if your broker has one, you need to be using that checklist. Remember, um, uh, and I'll talk about TCs in a second. So remember that you are the captain of the ship. You are. And so you know, I get this conversation all the time where the, the agent says, just send everything to my TC. No, 
Uh, I talk about this all the time. I'm sending everything to you. If you give me a writing that says send everything to my TC, I will copy your TC, but I'm still going to send everything to you because I need to be able to defend myself from the Department of Real Estate saying, why didn't you tell the agent that this was going on? And, and, uh, and I say, well, I was telling the TC and the, the DRE says they're not the agent. Right. And so uh, so the agent for the broker is the person I need to be communicating with. And you need to be really careful about this. OK, um, so I've had some heated conversations with with people you know, over the subject. But you have the real estate license. You are the captain of the ship. You signed page 15 of the purchase agreement, not the TC. OK. All right. Do not rely on the transaction coordinator. All right. Um, and but that's going to there's some de, there's some depends in this. Right. Unless your broker instructs you to do so. So we have what we refer to as in-house TCs. Right. Someone employed by the broker to do things. And and I think, frankly, I think you should use the in-house TC. I really do. Um, you know, we run a tra transaction management company, which so is like a TC on steroids kind of thing, but we do, we do a lot of stuff. So, but your TC as a, a non-licensed individual really shouldn't be doing more than shuffling paper around and getting things signed. But I see TCs all the time. I had a TC uh, half an hour ago or 45 minutes ago, giving me legal advice. And I went, Really? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I'm cool with it. I said, you know, hell, I got a law degree. I don't give legal advice, but that's pretty interesting. So sometimes they come like they really know what they're doing. But remember, the responsibility belongs if they are in house. The responsibility is going to belong to the broker. Okay, um, so assumedly the broker has uh, trained them, and that's what we used to do. That when I was with the Rock people back in the '90s. That was when TC started, you know, we, we hired TCs because we figured, you know, the agents would come and go, but we could train the TC to make sure that the file was complete. And, and we were so busy. I was reviewing 188 transactions a month and uh, we were so busy. We had three TCs full time, all of them. And so all busy. Okay. So, uh, um, so if your broker tells you to rely on the TC, then go for it. Okay. All right. Um, if it is an, in, <coughs> excuse me, if it is an in-house TC, <coughs> excuse me, if it is an in-house TC, you may have some protection. Um, they, they, they may be covered by the employer's insurance, you know, actions of the employer, you know, somebody that the employer hired, that kind of thing. But if they are not an in-house TC, if they are from outside of your brokerage, we have a couple of other issues. And so I, I got yelled at by a good friend of mine who was actually one of our TCs at Prudential 25, 30, 30 years. Oh my God, 30 years ago. Um, and she said, you know, you cost me a, a client, a brokerage firm. And I go, how did I do that? And she says, you, you told them to make sure I had insurance. And <laughs> Well, do you? Uh, so there is insurance available, e and insurance available to transaction coordinators, okay? And again, this person is no longer working for the brokerage. Now she's an independent, he or she is an independent transaction coordinator and, and a good one too, but has no insurance. And so said to me, said, I can't afford it. And I said, well, then you're not charging enough. Um, you've got liability. So, you know, you need to have insurance. And, and uh, I said, why don't you check and find out how much it is? And they came back and they said like $3,000 a year or something. And so, you know, I know we're working off of nickels, but if they are in-house, you may have some protection. If they are from outside of your brokerage, a couple of steps you need to follow. Number one, get approval in writing from your broker to use that person. Your broker may have some good examples and, and I get it. Your broker wants you to use the in-house transaction coordinator if there even is one. Um, and so I think you should follow your broker's advice. I really do. Um, because you, obviously you'll be able to pin it on something else if something goes wrong. But the other thing is make sure that they have E&O insurance coverage. And so I just don't know one that has it. Um, uh, I don't know any of them that have it, uh, but I don't. that doesn't mean they all don't have it. That just means I don't know of any anyone that has it. Um, I actually pay insurance for being a transaction manager for uh, companies. And so I pay additional insurance for that. So, um, so you know, just be aware. Um, 
make sure that that policy identifies you and your brokerage, right? Because we want to protect the broker, right? And usually in, in California, you can't even get your own, you it, know, it only, it's only sold to the brokers. Um, in other states, we were brokered in Idaho and individual agents have to buy their own E&O insurance. And for some strange reason, it's $125 a year, whereas here it's like it's costing at least that much per transaction. So, uh, well, welcome to California, right? OK. All right. So uh, document everything. And I want to show you, uh, let me see here, load it into your transaction management platform. All right. So your emails, your telephone calls, because I know you have a conversation log, right? I know you write things down and, and let me show you these things. So let me, I'm going to go in here right now and I'm going to go into, and I've already gone in here once into the transaction management platform that we happen to use. We happen to use zip forms. I know people to use dot loop and sky slope and all these things. I get that, but you will notice that when I go to my document section, let's take a look here. Um, when I go to my document section, I have the ability to, to um, where did it go? Now it's gone. Um, uh, add folders, add documents. So for my emails, I'm going to load up my email. Oh, I'm in a template. That's why it's not letting me, uh, uh, let me see here. Uh, let me pull up a, I'm going to pull up a, a class I'm doing on the RPA. Um, so here's, here I am. And so from in here, I have different hot buttons up here. Okay. But, you know, I can do, um, um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, upload my documents. So from in here, I want to add a folder, for example, um, if because I, I was looking here, I want to upload documents into a folder. So I can create a folder and, and I give it a name and then I click on add a document and then it pulls it up. So you need to be PDFing your emails. Um, I almost never talk to people on the phone anymore unless I'm got the salesperson hat on, but I'm always going to follow up with it and, and go to the documentation, you know, uh, by email. Okay. So, but notice here, so I'm going to upload my emails. Notice here, my notes button, I'm going to create a new note, right? And notice that it time and date stamps everything from when I did it. So I'm going to tell you, I know it's tough in the program because it's got a timeout feature, but if you're talking to people about the transaction, then you need to be taking notes because you want everything in the same place. We, we had a broker who asked us to defend them um, for the, from the Department of Real Estate. And the Department of Real Estate sent out a letter that said, you know, send us all of send us your entire file, including your email messages. And the agent said, and the agent was a broker, and the, and the broker said, you know, I've got five different email addresses. How am I going to possibly find all that? And I said, well, you don't want to not respond to the Department of Real Estate, right? I mean, you need to respond to them. And, and so they had five different addresses, and, and they had to literally ship. The, they want the printed version down at the Department of Real Estate. So they literally had to ship the printed versions of everything. It was boxes full of stuff in one transaction, right? And so, and it was, uh, by the way, responding to a complaint from a, a seller who really wasn't a seller. And, and it was kind of a weird, fishy situation. The Department of Real Estate turned on that person instead for filing the claim. But in the meantime, you, you have an obligation to defend. And so if you don't respond, they just suspend your license. Since, you know, they, they've got all kinds of you know, administrative things that they can do. So, so notice in here, time and date stamp. Um, and then and, and this is how I'm going to uh, keep my notes. Question, uh, how to download all emails related to one transaction? Well, that's a good question. So one of the ways that you do that is when you are creating your emails, always have the address in the signature, in the subject line, okay? So if you have the address, then you can just search in your emails for the, the uh, subject matter, the, the address of the property. And so if somebody sends you an email, usually they're responding to you, right? But if, if they send you an email without the address in it, then you probably wanna save that one as a PDF. And so what you do is you just go, like in our office, we don't print documents. We just go ahead and, and save everything as PDFs. So when we hit the print button on the document, it pulls up a PDF and we we put it in the folder on our hard drive and then we move it over here when we're done with that and i keep everything inside of the zip forms product that way i can go and delete my files elsewhere because i'm going to have access to everything in here and if i keep everything in the same place and, and the department has said whatever you do keep it someplace where you can get to it in two years and nine months when the complaint is filed right so this is why i tell you to document everything and i'm going to go a little bit over um, but but i 
I just wanted to show you how to do the uh, um, upload the documents, you know, uh, add document, and then the notes. I'm going to keep my notes inside of here. Okay, so let me pull, go back to my presentation here. Um, telephone calls, because you write down the gist of your phone calls, right? And I'm amazed at the things that people will say to me on the telephone. I had a, I was with an attorney once. We were getting out of a Padres game down in. Uh, the stadium somewhere and we're driving along and real estate agent calls me and and you know i've got them on the bluetooth and and i'm usually pretty curious i say well linda's here well in this case you know one of our attorneys is here and so they, they went on about this thing i didn't even have a chance to tell them you know you've got the attorney sitting right here in the car and so they got done and after we hung up on the call the attorney turns to me and said, they talk like that? <laughs> I said, I, you know, what do I, you know, they don't talk to me, you know, like that, but that's what kind of went on happening. Text messages, it is a particular pet peeve of mine, but if you are doing a real estate transaction, you need to put your text messages in your platform so that they're all in the same place because you're not going to be able to scurry around, you know, unless you're like me, I'm doing a hundred deals a year, right? I'm still doing this, okay? But I don't text with clients. So, so I don't need to put any text messages anywhere, but you could have software. I actually have software that backs up my text messages, you know, as they occur. But, but uh, you know, I was deposed uh, uh, in a lawsuit uh, not that long ago. And the attorney said, you know, first thing in the morning, the attorney says, where are your text messages? You didn't send me any of your text messages. And, and obviously this is opposing counsel. And so I said, uh, I don't have any. And she says, you don't have any text messages? I said, yeah, I don't text with clients. That's that's a business practice of mine. Nowhere, anywhere are you going to see a text with a client. If people text me, I ignore it anyway. I'm just going to delete it or whatever, but I don't respond to it. So it ruined her day because she was planning on deposing me all day with my text messages. And then I had another case where the agent said, well, I switched telephone service providers, so I don't have any of my text messages. And you know the attorney said? The attorney said, oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. We're going to go ahead and subpoena it. And, and again, guess what? They have all your text messages. So, so again, maybe some you don't want people to see. Um, so I just wouldn't text message with clients. That's just the way I am. So um, maintain good communications. Be careful what you email. This is so important, folks, because email is forever. And I had an attorney tell me this 30 years ago, and I've never forgotten it. Email is forever. And so you need to make sure that, you know, you are careful and precise about what you say. Okay, question. Um, some people only do text because they believe text requires faster response. Um, okay, uh, how to persuade them using email? I just, I just, uh, I ignore them, and then I will call them on the phone, and I will say, "Hey, Linda says you're trying to get a hold of me. I don't know how, but uh, how can I help?" Um, and then I'll, I'll maintain the dialogue by an email. I'm going to email. I'm not going to text people. So that's why I don't give anybody my cell phone number because I don't want to tempt them into thinking that I'm going to respond because I'm not going to. Do not text in a business relationship. I don't know if I said this earlier here today or in another class, but but you know I'm up there on the panel with Veronica Kilpatrick, the district manager for Southern California for the Department of Real Estate, right? And and. Uh, um, I had uh, Gov Hutchinson sitting next to me and Robert Sunderland sitting next to him. So the four of us, Robert Sunderland is one of the attorneys for Cress Insurance. So the four of us are sitting up there along with the district manager for the Department of Real Estate. And we all agreed, do not text message with clients. OK, and yet we have a broker in our office who says to me, says, hey, Kev, you need to get into the 90s. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, you are on your own. When the, when the district manager for the Department of Real Estate tells me not to text with clients, I'm listening to what she says, okay? In fact, I had a whole page of notes of just what she was responding to in, the, in that uh, panel in front of 1,200 people. And so, I don't know, get the message, okay? So do not text in a business relationship, family and friends only. Number eight, be the source of the source, not the source. So I told you earlier, you know, 858-755-9313. What's that? That's the telephone number to City of Del Mar Planning and Zoning. Give them a call and have them answer the question for you. Don't you go down there and ask the question because then again, you own it if you if you do that, okay? Um, so uh, be proactive in addressing complaints. Interestingly enough, the number one complaint against realtors is the same as the number one complaint against attorneys. They didn't return my call. Um, they're non-responsive. Stick your head in the mouth of the lion. If you see a problem coming, if it's something that you can deal with easily that's not potential litigation, then deal with it with your client. Don't cut them off. 
People do it all the time. They just stop talking to them, right? It's like, why do you do that? Or you take a listing and you're not happy with, you know, how much you, 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 you're getting paid. And so you just stop talking to the seller. Well, that's the worst thing you can do. You need to talk to these people, okay? And if it looks like something that's possibly uh, confrontational, then you need to get your broker in on it and tell your broker what's going on and take the advice of your broker. It's critically, critically important. So stick your head in the mouth of the lion. I am telling you, uh, I had a, a, a lender that I worked with. She was doing at, at least 95% of the loans that, you know, transactions that we were doing every year. And she would call me on the phone and she would say, here's what happened. And here's what I did about it. And she never called me up and said, Houston, we've got a problem. I never had that conversation with her. I love that. But she always called me to tell me what happened. She didn't hide it anywhere. Okay. Uh, question here. We're going to run just a couple minutes over. Hi, Lane. I had a transaction. Uh, so the texts were good as emails. Um, uh, I disagree. Okay. So the question is, um, uh, uh, the DRE has said that texts were as good as emails. Um, so that's an employee at the Department of Real Estate, much like an employee at the IRS. You know, they're not responsible for anything that they say. Um, and at the end of the day, um, anything you send. So when I send an email to somebody, I elicit a response. I, I, I send them an email and then and I get them to respond to me. They can't deny it, but they can deny that they got my text message or not unless they responded to it. So there's just too many parts moving around on that one. Um, but, you know, listen, I love the DRE uh, and, and I listen to what they say, but I'm going to probably listen to the district manager on that one. So, um, you know, I went up to the commissioner at the last meeting in Sacramento, and, and I chaired last year risk management for the state of California, California Association of Realtors, and, and he immediately followed with a DRE forum in the same room. And so when he got there, I went up and I said, hey, I just want to thank you for what you're doing. You know, I'm realtor risk management and consumer protection. We're in the same job, right? The same thing. Well, it turns out I had just done a presentation to the Department of Real Estate on the new RPA and everybody there knew who I was. And so sometimes it's okay. It's kind of like when you go to a restaurant, it's good if the maitre d' knows who you are, but it's not good if the bartender knows who you are, right? That kind of thing. So uh, so good. Uh, you, you do whatever you think is appropriate. I'm going to take uh, my advice from a higher authority. Um, the zoning phone number, Del Mar's uh, city uh, uh, planning and zoning is 858-755-9313. It's just in my head. So, um, you know, but but I refer to them a lot. So uh, uh, good. Okay. Uh, um, after checking in with your broker. So, you know, maybe not stick your head in the mouth of a lion and make sure that you're not stepping outside of your lane again. Okay. Conversation log. Remember, we always wrote down date and time. We had a conversation with somebody. Um, you know, uh, listen, I have to write mine down because when I'm talking to the, to the attorneys, it's admissible, you know, in deposition at trial and all that. So I'm writing everything down and, and maintaining a phone log because I might have to defend it later. Um, that also goes up into your, into where it's going to go up into your program, it's going to uh, add a document, right? You're going to click on add a document and, and pull it up into the program. Make sure you're you're doing that. You're putting those in, in where they need to be. So 100% um, of the broker files that I review don't have one. I, I don't, I can't remember the last time I saw a communication log, otherwise known as a conversation log. Um, and it's a shame. I had a lawsuit uh, a couple of years ago where the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I talk about a lot of lawsuits, but I'm in them, right? Um, and so uh, there's always somebody else that's not mine, but these two guys were on the same team in the same brokerage and they never spoke to each other. Everything was email back and forth. The, the seller's agent, the listing agent, um, you know, everything was email, the buyer's agent, everything was email. They're on the same team. They never talked with each other. Everything was email. And, and I get this, the, the uh, FedEx shows up with this dolly with 10 banker boxes. And I know, okay, this is going to be a good lawsuit. And so, you know, I'm going through these emails and never once did the seller's agent tell the buyer's agent how much the seller would take. And never once did the buyer's agent tell the seller's agent how much the, the buyer would pay. And yet that became the subject later on of the lawsuit by the buyer. Um, and so interestingly enough, there was no documentation and they did everything by email and never talked to each other. Uh, when I met with them at the brokerage firm, they didn't talk to each other then either. <laughs> it was just like, I don't know, you guys don't like each other or what? <laughs> you know, so, so anyway, just be aware, you need to have that conversation log 
uh, unless you're doing email, in which case you're going to save the email. Make certain that key transaction decisions belong to your client. Okay, so I, you know, listen, I I'll have a client tell me something, and then uh, and I'll tell the other agent. The other agent says, "Well, you can't do that." And I'll say, well, can you check with your client? I mean, you may be their agent, but you really need to have these decisions made by them. I just had this conversation with a, 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 a transaction coordinator and I said, you know, I ordered the natural hazard disclosure. Yes, I know the contract says something different, but now that I have it, I'm going to give it to you anyway. So you can go ahead and order the one the contract calls for, but, but I'm still going to give you mine because I have it. Right. And so I've documented all this. It's great stuff. Right. Um, but I'm going to make sure that now the, the, the seller can decide which one they're going to use. OK, uh, Jamie. Um, uh, if you if you want a copy uh, of anything that I'm doing here today, I don't I, I don't believe that I have any work product issues. I, I will send it to you, but you have to send me an email. Don't put it in here because if you put it in here, I'm not going to be able to to. Uh, recover it. So send me an email, uh, Kevin at Burke real estate consultants.com, or you can send an email to education at sdar.com. Um, be careful that you don't know too much. Um, again, I said this in the beginning, we're all very helpful people. We're trying to help our client, but we don't want to help ourselves into federal prison. Okay. So we're trying to help the client, but we need to know what responsibilities that we have. And, and I'm not going to give people uh, the, one of the lawsuits I had was where the, the buyer's agent made a comment about a stem wall uh, at a property that was a harbor front property. And they said, the stem wall looks fine to me. It was low tide. They looked at it and said, it looks fine to me. You're not a contractor. Oh my God, you can't even believe millions of dollars in legal fees back and forth uh, uh, because of that simple comment. Uh, and so they didn't have any expertise on stem walls. And listen, I became an expert on stem walls. And I didn't want to be one, but you know what? At the end of the day, don't operate outside of your field of expertise, stay in your lane. Send a confirming letter. If you have a conversation with someone that's a hot conversation, then you need to send them a, a confirming letter. So Jackie Oliver, who is one of our attorneys, uh, uh, one of the attorneys on the risk management committee at SDAR made this comment in a meeting and she said, Sir, said uh, uh, email is replacing certified mail. And I'm just thinking about, uh, was, Whose comment was it? Was it Lane's comment about the uh, text messages? Listen, um, I'm going to limit my liability because I'm only going to send things by an email and I'm going to get a response. And so that email has become a substitute for things. It is admissible, but I got to be able to prove they got it. Um, and so, you know, I know I have people that send me the, you know, here, click on here, the read receipt that you got it. I, you know, hey, anybody actually sign those? I mean, I, I opt out of those all the time. So, so be careful. It, it, it hypothetically replaces certified mail. Emails are okay if you get a written response, all right? So SDAR has a really good confirming letter, and here's the link for you to go get it. Or if you send me an email, I will send you a copy of the letter. Uh, CAR liked it so much, they finally copied it and put it in their library. And so, you know, where is that library? Look, I'm going to show you this, and, and I know some of you see me say it. See up here where it says all forms? Um, the default in the forms is going to say, uh, click here to view libraries. Yeah, what, what are you doing here? Now it's not letting me do anything. Oh, here we go. All the libraries. So see here's California Association of Realtors, Virginia Association. You have all these things. I go down here to NAR Realtor Forms and Templates. Okay, so all I do is I click this up here where this was. By default, it'll say California Association of Realtors. But then I click it. It drops this down. I now go to... NAR realtor forms and templates. Look at all these things. Look at all these. This is a, it's a course in real estate right here. How to pack like a pro, how to navigate uh, a short sale, um, how to move with pets. There's so much great stuff. So they have confirming letters in here as well. Uh, question, uh, how do you request a response if you email them? Uh, so my email will always, uh, if you look at the confirming letter, my email will follow the gist of that. And it says, on the, my last sentence always says, if this does not comport with your understanding of our conversation, please notify me immediately. So three years from now, when they're suing me, I go, well, I sent you this email and you know, you, you said everything was fine. 
you, you didn't respond. And so, you know, I'm going to take your silence as an admission because I've been sending you to this email address all this time and you've never not gotten it before. So to answer your question, Lena, I'm going to load the question up. If you don't have, if, you, if any of that doesn't make sense or that's not what we talked about, you need to let me know right away. Okay. And I'm bringing that to court with me. All right. Okay, good. Okay. So I showed you a bunch of stuff in here. Um, the three most important words in real estate, number 10. How am I doing? Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Okay, three most important words in real estate. And somebody said to me once it was location, location, location. I don't think so. I think it's disclose, disclose, disclose. Okay, I think you need to, disclosures need to be at the top of your list of, of things that you're going to do. Okay, um, disclose, don't diagnose. All right, so your job is to disclose what you saw, not tell them what caused it or where it's from. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the water stain noted in the ceiling and the agent, you know, if you just hadn't put water in there and sure enough, transaction closes, buyer goes up to fix the source of the water leak and it's paint cans. And so now it's a hazardous material, you know, hazmats out there. That was uh, 30 years ago. That was only $250,000 settlement on that one. Uh, but I've had other people, you know, uh, it's a minor settling crash. Back. Listen, you don't have the expertise to say that. First of all, minor. Uh, second of all, settling. Why don't you just say crack noted in driveway, right? So in a particular case I'm aware of, the, the end of the house broke off, right? Uh, you know, shortly after closing because it had been built, it had been built on cut. So they'd cut into the side of the hill to build the house. But then there was a portion of the house that was on fill, which is where they put dirt in to try to bring it up to the level of the rest of the house. And the fill wasn't compacted properly. Well, I don't even want to tell you what that one ended up looking like. It was ugly. Um, Maybe two words. It depends. Oh, yeah, my answer. So in law school, thanks for bringing that up, Lena. So in law school, the answer was always, we were always taught, uh, the answer is, it depends. Um, after law school, we were told that uh, that it was, uh, it was I don't recall. <laughs> so uh, would you please back up to link for SDR confirmation letter? Yes. Uh, or, or send me an email, I'll send it to you. Okay. Um, so thank you, Jane. Thanks for asking the question. You got it? Okay. We good? Okay. Send me an email. I will send it to you. Okay. All right. Uh, 13. Uh, got it. Good. Thank you, Jane. And again, I'll send you all this stuff. Um, I'll send you my PowerPoint. I don't care. Right. I, I change it every time I'm, uh, you know, out here doing stuff. So uh, I went through that. I spent an hour and a half on this um, just to update it. Okay. So uh, don't diagnose. That's clear. All right. Um, disclosures. So remember, we have statutory disclosures that contain rescission rights, which means put the parties back in the position they were in prior to contract. Okay. Very powerful things. Then we have contractual cancellation rights. So like your uh, your uh, rescission rights attached to your TDS, uh, you know, Civil Code 1102.3, your NHD is 1103.7. Um, and these are the kind of conversations I have with the lawyers. We talk about 0 0.7, 0 0.6, right? And these are the conversations I have with the lawyers. You don't want to know all this. You just want to know that there are different rights associated with different disclosures. And so you need to make sure you make all those disclosures. You've got to know the difference. I do a whole class on contractual versus statutory disclosures. Um, you, you might have even seen it in my list of templates. Um, so uh, I have too many of those little things in there. So as a general rule, send and receive everything from within your transaction management software. That's why I showed you how to, how to create notes and then how to also send things to people. So, uh, so let's just take a look at it really quick. Um, I want to go back in. Here's my purchase agreement. Um, I'm going to click on the purchase agreement, and then I'm going to notice that at the top of the page, it says send. And so I'm going to send it as an email to somebody. It'll pop up the email addresses and all that stuff, right? So I'm going to send it to them as an email. So this is what I do with my buyer. I send them the offer prior to sending it to them for signature. And I say, when you get this, give me a call. We will go over this line by line. They're going to get tired of listening to me, right? Because I my the DRE class I just created is five hours long. I, I tear this document apart, right? I sent one up on, the, on that note. And I also sent one up on the buyer representation agreement, but I send everything out of here. So now when I go over, when I go back to my main page here, I go up here, see where it says history. It documents everything that I've done. 
All right, does that make sense? It documents everything. And I've used this in trial. I've, I've told the attorney, get me a copy of the history of what the agent did in the transaction. And, and that's where we end up with the, you know, all the stuff. So, uh, and I'm gonna use that to help defend the agent, okay? All right, um, uh, send everything from in there. General rule that includes uh, emails, telephone calls, text messages, do not use buyer interest letters. I think we're all kind of getting the message on that. Um, if you're getting my newsletter, I have the, all the direct links to each of these Q and A's. So if you're if you're getting my newsletter, you've got the you know you have. You just click on the link and it takes you right there. Which by the way, also my classes, you just click on it, it gets you right into the class rather than you going to the screen that says you know uh, oh sorry it's sold out. No no no, I want you in my class. So so uh, you know I'm 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 grateful for you to be in my class. Removing contingencies at the time of the offer, I wouldn't do it. If you do, have your clients sign off on CAR's Q&A on non-contingent offers, and then now they have their own non-contingent offer advisories and, and uh, you know, and, and then the contingency removal form, right? So all these things, uh, SDAR has, I think, a, I think it's a better non-contingent offer advisory. I like SDAR's better. Um, anytime they remove a contingency at the time of contract, I'm going to have them sign it. I don't care one or all. I don't care. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see here. I'm doing all these other things. Um, these are other topics that that I, uh, uh, you know, you don't pay anything for this, I hope. <laughs> so anyway, there's the YouTube website. Uh, was it Jamie who asked the question about uh, where am I going to find these? Uh, Jane. Okay, so uh, there there is a YouTube website this is SDAR. This is called a short link. And so case is important. So bit.ly forward slash YouTube SDAR with a Y, the T and SDAR all being an uppercase that takes you straight there. Or you can uh, send me an email and I will send you the link. And because I want you to have this, uh, you know, I, I, I complain all the time about how great we are in creating solutions to problems. But since what we're doing at the association level is constantly doing that, we forget to tell you where it is. And I think that's the biggest mistake we make in real estate. And like CAR does some great stuff, but we forget to tell you, we moved on to the next problem. We forgot to tell you where it was. I want to be your resource. Okay. So please let me know. I will never get in front of your broker. Uh, just let me know if you're having an issue with something and I'm more than happy to help you. You know that. So uh, um, I've gone 15 minutes over. I do apologize. I, I, I tell, Linda says I tell too many stories, but okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Anything else I can help you with? Remembering that tomorrow we're going to have uh, tomorrow in the morning at 10 o'clock. What am I doing in the morning? Um, Oh, shoot, I forgot what I'm doing in the morning. Um, in the afternoon, I'm doing uh, the buyer representation agreement at two o'clock. So uh, so the morning class at 10, and you can always go to SDAR's website and pull up the education calendar. Uh, so, you know, to use as an example here, not that one. Uh, where did it go? Uh, here we go. I just happened to be on the DRE's website just recently. But uh, if I go over here and I go to the SDAR website, uh, SDR.com. And then up here where it says education, uh, the drop down will, will take me to, they've redesigned the website. Look at that. But the drop down will take me to, uh, oh, you know what it is? It's got a pop-up blocker. Uh, I should have done it under Google here. Hang on a second here. Yeah, I closed the Google window. Okay. So never mind. So anyway, that's the, the end result is go to SDR's website and you can get the, um, you can get, uh, direct links to the education classes and things like that. So Miriam, when is your five hour RPA class? <laughs> Great question, Miriam. I'm waiting for approval. Um, you know, I, I do the RPA and it's funny because I was talking to another attorney who, uh, who was doing it uh, for a different association. And he said, yeah, they had me doing it in an hour. And, and he says, I finally, I just told him I can't do it. It's 16 pages. You know, I need more time. So we all have kind of agreed that, thank you, Lena. We've all agreed that you need at least three hours, and that's if you're in a hurry. We're going to spend an hour and a half just on paragraph number three. So uh, yesterday for a broker, I did a class on, on uh, just the changes to the RPA, and it was an hour. 
So, um, you know, the RPA is a great document. It's more dynamic than it ever has been. I love the RPA. There's a bunch of stuff that needs fixing. It's not right, right? But uh, I'm going to tell you something. It's a great document. And so I sent all my material up. And DRE says it's going to take us 90 days to decide what we're going to do. I'm, I'm thinking that mine will probably happen a little faster than that. But uh, uh, anyway, that's where it is. So, Miriam, thank you for asking the questions. Uh, and then uh, uh, I'm thinking that, and that'll be DRE credit, by the way, five credit hours. So, uh, um, but uh, coming to a theater near you. Uh, and so, in fact, the association has asked me to, to kick that up there and, and get that class approved. So I, I've got the class ahead of them on the RPA. And then I've also sent up the BRE, uh, the, the BRBC. And then I'm, I'm now going to create a class on the listing agreement. And then I'm going to create classes on fair housing and on implicit bias and, and all that stuff. And again, all from the practitioner's level, right? I mean, the lawyers can write these things, but, but you and I, we do it in the streets, as Neil Kalin said to me once, you know, so you know, I want to make sure you're okay. Uh, so thank you for asking the question. So are there any other questions? I've gone way past my time. I apologize. I'm in the middle of your lunch hour. Um, if there aren't any questions, send me an email. I'm happy to respond. I respond to all emails. Uh, and so uh, all 1600 a day of them. So uh, please send me an email. I'm happy to respond to you. Thank you all for being here. And as we say from my hometown of Del Mar, I look forward to seeing you around the track. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now.